Your refrigerator is lying to you. It whispers that you're safe, that your meat will keep, that the power will always be on. But when the grid fails, when the generator runs dry, when the ice melts, you've got about 48 hours before everything inside becomes a biohazard. Here's what your ancestors knew that you forgot. Meat doesn't need electricity to last. It needs salt, smoke, time, and an understanding of what actually kills you. Let me show you how to preserve meat for years, maybe decades, using methods that predate the light bulb and will outlast the apocalypse. Here's the thing nobody tells you about meat preservation. Meat doesn't rot because it wants to. It rots because bacteria, the microscopic vandals of the protein world, need three things to throw their decomposition party, water, warmth, and oxygen. Your job is to crash that party by removing at least one of those three elements, preferably two, ideally all three if you're feeling ambitious. Every preservation method we're about to cover is just a different way of telling bacteria to go to hell. The science is brutally simple. Bacteria are 70% water just like you. When you suck the moisture out of meat, you're not just drying it. You're creating a hostile desert where bacterial cells rupture and die because the salt gradient rips the water right out of their membranes through osmosis. It's cellular genocide, and it's kept humans fed for 10,000 years. Method 1. The salt cure. Dry method. This is the nuclear option. You're going to turn that meat into a salt brick that laughs at decomposition. Here's how it works. Salt doesn't just draw out moisture. It creates an environment so hostile that even the hardiest bacteria wave the white flag. Take your meat, any meat, doesn't matter. Pat it dry with a cloth, because starting wet is starting stupid. Now cover every square inch with coarse salt, and I mean bury it. Use about one pound of salt per five pounds of meat. Don't be shy. This isn't seasoning, this is warfare. Mix your salt with 2% sodium nitrite if you can get it. That's Prague powder number one, the pink stuff. It prevents botulism, the toxin that turns your preservation project into a murder weapon. If you can't get it, increase your salt and accept slightly higher risk. The salt alone will work, humans did it for millennia, but the nitrite is your insurance policy. Pack your salted meat in a non-reactive container. Wood, glass, ceramic, anything but metal that'll corrode. Layer it like you're building a salty lasagna. Meat, salt, meat, salt. Cover it and stick it somewhere cool. Not cold, just cool. 50, 60 degrees mouth is perfect. Wait two days per inch of meat thickness. A two inch thick slab gets four days. During this time, the salt is ripping moisture out of every cell, creating a brine that you'll drain off every few days. That liquid is your enemy leaving the building. Let it go. After the cure time, brush off the salt, rinse briefly if you want, then hang it to dry. You want air circulation, low humidity, and patience. In two weeks to two months, depending on size, you'll have meat so dry and hard it could double as a weapon. It'll last years if kept dry. To eat it, you'll need to rehydrate by soaking, but you'll eat it. And that's the point. Method 2. The wet cure, the brine baptism. This is salt curing's gentler cousin, and it's perfect for larger cuts you want to keep relatively tender. The principle is identical. Salt kills bacteria. But instead of dry packing, you're drowning the meat in a saturated salt solution. Make your brine. One pound of salt per gallon of water. Add one cup of sugar if you have it. Not for sweetness, but because it feeds the beneficial bacteria that create that characteristic cured flavor. Add Prague powder, number one, at one ounce per 25 pounds of meat. Boil it, cool it completely, and I mean ice cold, because putting meat in warm brine is asking for botulism. Submerge your meat completely. Use a weighted plate if it floats. Every exposed surface is a bacteria playground, and we're not running a playground. Keep it submerged in a cool location, 36 to 40 degrees a case if possible. Three days per pound of meat is your baseline. A 10 pound ham gets 30 days, Check it weekly, skim any scum that forms on top and give it a sniff. It should smell like salt and meat, not death. If it smells like death, you failed and should start over with colder temperatures. After curing, pull it out, rinse it, and hang it to dry for at least a week. This forms a pellicle, a dry outer layer that seals the meat and prevents surface bacteria from taking hold. Once dry, it'll keep for months cool or years if you smoke it afterward. Stack preservation methods like you're building a fortress against rot. Method. 
3. Smoke, the original fumigation. Smoke is chemical warfare disguised as flavor. It deposits hundreds of antimicrobial compounds, formaldehyde, phenols, organic acids, onto your meat surface, creating a toxic wasteland for bacteria, while simultaneously drying the meat and sealing it with a protective layer of condensed smoke particles. Start with meat that's already been salt cured. Smoking alone is preservation light. Smoking after curing is immortality. Build or use a smokehouse or hell improvise with a cardboard box and some hardware cloth. I don't care if it's ugly. Function over form. Use hardwood only. Oak, hickory, apple, cherry, anything that grows slow and burns aromatic. Never pine, never resinous woods unless you want meat that tastes like turpentine and makes you sick. The smoke should be cool under 90 degrees, or you're cooking instead of preserving. This is cold smoking, the marathon, not the sprint. Hang your meat and smoke it continuously for days to weeks depending on size. Small fish gets 12 hours. A whole ham gets a week. The meat should darken to mahogany, develop a hard outer crust, and smell like a campfire had a baby with a delicatessen. The magic happens in layers. Smoke compounds penetrate about a quarter inch deep, forming a bacteria-proof barrier. Below that, the salt cure is doing its job. Together, they're unstoppable. Store smoked meat wrapped in cloth in a cool, dry place. It'll last a year easily, multiple years if conditions are right. Pro tip, smoke generation, not heat generation, is your goal. If you see flames, you've failed. You want smoldering wood that produces thick white to blue smoke. Add sawdust to chips for sustained smoke output. Check it every few hours. Let the smoke work. Method four, the fat seal can fit for apocalypse. This is how the French survived before refrigeration, and it's so simple it feels like cheating. The principle, bacteria need oxygen to multiply. Fat provides none. Submerge your meat in rendered fat, and you've created an anaerobic vault that laughs at time. Cook your meat first, fully, duck, pork, whatever you've got. Cook it in its own fat if possible, or add lard or tallow. Season it heavily with salt. You're not making dinner, you're making a time capsule. Once cooked, pack the meat tightly into a ceramic crock or glass jar. Pour the rendered fat over it until every piece is completely submerged with at least an inch of fat on top. No air gaps, no exposed meat. As it cools, the fat will solidify into a seal harder than most people's resolve during a grid-down scenario. Store it cool, and it'll last six months to a year. To use it, dig out what you need, reheat it in its own fat, and reseal the remainder. The fat is reusable until it starts to smell off, or you run out of meat to preserve. This method works because fat is a better barrier than most people's excuses. It blocks oxygen, it blocks moisture migration, and it stabilizes temperature. It's a fortress made of lipids, and your meat is the king inside. Method 5. Drying the Jerky Endgame this is the oldest trick in the protein preservation playbook, and it works because bacteria can't metabolize what isn't there. Remove enough water, and meat becomes shelf-stable indefinitely. You're making biological leather that you can eat. Slice your meat thin, one quarter inch maximum. Against the grain for tenderness, with the grain for structural integrity if you're making pemmican later. Remove all visible fat, because fat goes rancid while lean meat just gets harder. Season it heavily with salt, minimum 2% by weight. Add pepper, add spices if you're feeling fancy, but the salt is non-negotiable. It's your insurance against the bacteria that thrive in partially dried meat. Hang it on racks in full sun, or in a dehydrator if you're still living in civilization. Cover it with cheesecloth or mesh to keep flies off, because flies are nature's way of saying, this is mine now. In hot, dry conditions, you'll have jerky in 8 to 12 hours. In humid conditions, you might need days and supplemental heat. The test. Bend a piece. If it snaps, it's done. If it bends and returns to shape, keep drying. If it bends and stays bent, you're in the danger zone and need more time. Store dried meat in airtight containers with oxygen absorbers if you have them. Without them, it'll still last months in a cool, dry place. With them, you're looking at years. Advanced move. Make pemmican, pulverize your jerky into powder, mix it 50-50 with rendered fat, add dried berries if you're not a barbarian, pack it into cakes.
This is the survival food that sustained Arctic explorers and Native American tribes through winters that would kill modern humans in days. It lasts decades if kept cool and dry. Method six, the combination kill, maximum overkill. Here's where you stop playing defense and go full scorched earth. You don't pick one method, you use all of them. Salt cure, then smoke, then fat seal, or dry, then pound into powder, then mix with fat. Stack your preservation methods like you're building a bunker because you are. The Inuit did this with fish. They'd ferment it slightly for flavor, dry it in the wind, then store it in seal fat. The result lasted years and sustained life in conditions that would kill everything else. The pioneers did this with pork, salt cure, smoke, then pack in lard. Some of those hams lasted literal decades in root cellars and tasted like concentrated history. Your job is to think like someone who knows the power's not coming back. Every preservation method you add is another middle finger to entropy. Bacteria need water, oxygen and warmth. You're denying them all three, then salting the earth for good measure. The cold truth is this. Refrigeration is a luxury your ancestors never had, and you might not have it again. They kept meat through wars, through famines, through winters that lasted months using nothing but salt, smoke, thyme, and the physics of bacterial death. These methods aren't relics. They're your backup plan when the fragile just-in-time supply chain collapses, when the power grid fails, when the refrigerator becomes an expensive box that doesn't work. You're not prepping for fantasy. You're acknowledging that complexity is fragility, that dependence is weakness, and that the ability to preserve protein without electricity is the difference between resilience and starvation. Master these methods now, while you still have time to fail safely and learn. Because when you need them, when it matters, when the choice is between eating meat you preserved six months ago and eating nothing, you won't be experimenting. You'll be surviving. The cold is coming one way or another. The difference between you and the ones who didn't prepare isn't luck, it's knowledge, applied ruthlessly to the problem of keeping meat from becoming poison. If your preserved meat lasts through winter, you didn't get lucky. You understood that bacteria are predictable, that physics doesn't care about your convenience, and that the oldest ways work because they have to. You won.